Welcome to Life of the Mind, Great Lectures from the Grove. I'm Peter Frank, Provost at Grove City College, and I want to introduce to you this next course on the topic of socialism. In this seven-part series, faculty from various disciplines here at Grove City College tackle this topic historically while also relating socialism to our current times. I hope you enjoy this next series in the life of the mind, great lectures from the Grove. Hello, I'm Sean Rittenauer, Professor of Economics at Grove City College, and I want to talk to you today about the importance of society and human flourishing. As Maria von Trapp reminded us in The Sound of Music, let's start at the beginning. It's a very good place to start. Well, the book of Genesis is rightly called the book of beginnings. Not only does the word Genesis itself mean beginning, but the foundation of knowledge concerning so many issues of our life are found there as well. Now, this foundation includes the basis of all scientific inquiry as well as economics. And from the very first chapter, we find that we are in a teleological universe. God made all things for a purpose and gave man the first commandment to be fruitful and multiply, to replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over every living thing that moves on the earth. And we are called to do this now, however, in our present world faced with scarcity, severely aggravated by the fall of man. Now, fulfilling the creation mandate requires wise balance. It is possible that we rationally try to draw too much from creation too quickly, or make changes too abruptly, or to do so without replenishing the earth. We could pave paradise and put up a parking lot. We can, however, err on the other extreme and act as if nature is a museum and we are its curator, keeping it free from the impact of humanity. In short, we could follow the mantra of MC Hammer, can't touch this. Now, doing either would be an abdication uh, to our call to faithfully exercise dominion over creation. And since our banishment from the Garden of Eden, man has faced a central cultural dilemma. How do we exercise dominion and sustain a growing population in a fallen world of aggravated scarcity without either starving to death or killing one another in a barbaric struggle for survival? This is not a moot question. Whether they know it or not, different societies seek to answer this question with every change of economic institution and policies. And this brings us to the reason for this series of lectures. Decades after the collapse of the Soviet Union, a growing number of our fellow citizens are embracing one or more aspects of socialism. They see certain conditions such as poverty or economic and social inequality and conclude that a move to a more socialistic society will help. We will see later in the series that history is full of stark examples revealing that different attempts to solve our dilemma have resulted in widely different consequences. To put it bluntly, socialism does not make good on its promises. Instead of promising life, abundance, and civilization, wherever socialism has been tried good and hard, it has yielded barbarism, privation, starvation, and death. To understand why socialism goes wrong and fails so miserably, it is important to understand how things can go right. It should be apparent that multiplying the population and subduing and exercising dominion over the earth requires economic progress. It obviously requires survival and each person developing their potential, and it requires the development of the potential of the natural order. It turns out that sound economics provides us valuable guidance. Economic theory, rooted in an understanding of man as a rational actor created in God's image, teaches us to materially fulfill God's, God's creation mandate and promote human flourishing. We must take advantage of the division of labor, capital accumulation, improvements in technology and entrepreneurship. To function at their best, these sources of economic progress require the social institutions of private property and sound money. In short, they require a free society. 
As will become evident in later lectures, people fail to heed economic truth at their peril. Now, human flourishing is aided by economic progress. And when we think of economic progress, we think of two terms, economic expansion and economic development. Economic expansion happens when we have more goods per person, more food, more clothing, more shelter, more goods used in recreation. Economic development is even broader than that. It means a greater variety of goods, a better quality, goods that will improve our lives and increase human welfare. Refrigeration increases the quality and variety of goods available. Trains, automobiles, and airplanes increase mobility. Books, newspapers, radio, television, and now the internet provide at least opportunities to broaden our horizon. Medical innovation leads to longer, healthier lives. In short, economic development provides a different quality of life. It contributes, rather, toward the material aspect of human flourishing. Now, human progress, as we've described it here, requires production, of course. But to benefit from more and better goods, we need to be more productive with the resources we have. Economic theory identifies four elements contributing to economic prosperity, the first of which is the division of labor. In a society constituted by the division of labor, production is oriented to what can be sold in the market. People produce goods not because they want to consume them, but because they think they can trade them for other goods that they want more. This is the primary mode of production in more developed, wealthier societies because it is more productive than self-sufficiency. Now, the division of labor is so ubiquitous that people tend to ignore it because it seems to just happen, but it doesn't just happen. Now, we define the division of labor as specialization of production according to efficiency. Now, in this definition, there are two very important words. One is specialization, and the other is sufficiency. Specialization means that each person produces a particular good or set of goods in excess of their own personal consumption. A good example of this is James P. Snee. He is a chairman and CEO of Hormel Corporation. Now, its flagship product is Spam, uh, the canned pork product, not junk email. Hormel makes bacon and other food products, but everyone knows them for Spam. And last year, they produced hundreds of millions of cans of Spam, enough so an estimated 12.8 cans of Spam are eaten somewhere in the world every second. This seems unbelievable, but it is true. Now, I suspect that James Snee, uh, James Snee did not oversee the production of that much Spam because he wants to eat it all. And I'm very thankful that he didn't, or he would no longer be with us because he would have died of a stroke. No, Snee's company specializes in spam production not because he wants to eat it, but because other people want to eat it. At the same time, Snee's consumption needs are met by others who specialize producing those things that Snee does demand. Snee and Hormel produces spam because they are very efficient at it. And this brings us to the next aspect of the division of labor. It is not merely specialization, but specialization according to efficiency. Who produces what in the division of labor is determined by efficiency. And the efficient producer is the one who has the lowest opportunity cost of production. He is the one who is relatively more productive than anybody else at producing something. Note that while economists call this principle the division of labor, it actually applies to all factors of production. There is a specialization of land according to efficiency. There's a specialization of capital goods according to efficiency. So what we call the division of labor is actually the division of production. Now, the reasons for differences in efficiency has to do with differences in geography, differences in capital goods endowments, and differences in people. There are differences, for example, in natural resources. Some people live in the grasslands of western Nebraska and that is very suitable for cattle grazing and ranching. Now, there is not a lot of king crab harvesting that goes on in the sandhills of Nebraska. Why? Well, there are no king crabs in the sandhills of Nebraska. On the other hand, in Alaska, king crab production is the number one industry. That's where the king crabs are. Another reason people might be more efficient at the production of one good over another is differences in endowments of capital goods. Why would someone be a fourth generation blacksmith in days gone by? Because they inherited the blacksmith shop, the billows, and the anvil, and the other tools suitable for blacksmithing. So it was relatively more efficient for that person to become a blacksmith than to do something else requiring a different set of capital goods. 
A third important difference is a difference is in the skill and desirability of labor. Some people have many practical talents, manual dexterity, and physical strength, while others are more bookish and tend to specialize in academic pursuits. As the Whalen and Willie song indicates, some become cowboys, while others become doctors and lawyers and such. Now, given the differences in labor abilities, resources, and capital goods endowments, people find it in their interest to specialize in making those goods at which they have a comparative advantage. And people have such a comparative advantage if they are the low opportunity cost producer of a particular good. As everyone specializes in producing goods they can make at the lowest cost compared to anyone else, the total output of all members of society increases. As people exchange their output with others who have participated in the division of labor, they are also able to consume more than they could without the division of labor. Now this division of labor is a manifestation of the law of association. It was James Mill and David Ricardo who argued that international trade is beneficial if countries specialized according to their comparative advantage. Ludwig von Mises moved the principle beyond the theory of international trade to develop what he, what he called the law of association, which says that specializing according to efficiency and comparative co and cooperative action is more efficient and productive than isolated action of self-sufficient individuals. As different people specialize in different tasks in different lines of production, they will be more productive both individually and socially and enjoy more material prosperity. Now, if we would say, well, want to supply all of our needs for food, clothing, and shelter and creature comforts, we could try to be self-sufficient. We could produce it all ourselves. But think about it. What would you do if you had to produce all of your clothes and all of the food you want to consume? It would be a great weight loss program, to be sure. Our food would be sparser. Our clothing would be less abundant. Our uh, homes would be a lot cruder. Ours would be a significantly poorer existence. But if a person can specialize in what he is relatively good at producing, and others can specialize in what they are good at, personally and socially we are more productive, and then we have more goods to trade for other goods that we need and want. Not only are we able to produce more, but we and our families are able to consume more, which is why the market division of labor contributes to human flourishing. Indeed, the market division of labor is so important that Ludwig von Mises referred to it as the fundamental social phenomenon. The division of labor is socially fundamental in two senses. It has been with us since the beginning of human history, and it is the driving force for the forming of societies. People learned long ago that it was more beneficial not to live as atomistic, self-sufficient individualists, but rather to join the market division of labor. And when doing so, they participate in society both needing and being needed by others. In fact, human society is possible precisely because of the greater productivity of the division of labor and of people's recognition of this fact. A second contributor to economic prosperity is capital accumulation. Capital goods are what we call produced means of production. They are the tools, the machines, the intermediate goods used in the production process. And using capital goods increases the productivity of the user. They allow us to produce a greater quantity of output than, they, than we could without capital goods. It is possible to farm without any capital goods. We could use our fingers, the soil, and some wild seed, and we could produce a certain crop, hopefully. Farming with tools, however, is much more productive. Historians tell us that in 1830, it took approximately 270 man hours to produce 100 bushels of wheat. By 1987, we had a more capital intensive farming so that it took only three hours to produce 100 bushels of wheat. Why the difference? Well, the farmer in 1987 was more productive. And I would argue that in 1987, the farmer was not more productive because he worked his fingers to the bone, while the farmer in 1830 sort of laid back drinking hard cider and only occasionally harvested some corn when he felt like it. No. A key difference is that the modern farmer has a lot more and better capital goods than his counterpart had in 1830. So using capital goods allows us to produce more goods than we could produce without capital goods. But more importantly, capital goods allow us to produce many goods that could not be produced at all without capital goods. Goods like watches, goods like automobiles or computers. Those consumer goods that we enjoy absolutely require the use of capital goods. So the accumulation and use of capital goods is crucial for economic progress. However, before capital goods can be used, they must first be produced. Before we can use a hammer to hammer in the morning and hammer in the evening all over the land, 
we must first produce the hammer. Before we can use a factory to produce smartphones, the factory must be built. And production of capital goods takes scarce resources. This means that to accumulate capital, people must save. We must be willing to put off present consumption so that we will have resources available to invest in the production of capital goods. And this implies that economic progress is not merely a material thing. It's not merely a physical or mechanical thing. It is dependent on our values. We need to be future-oriented enough to put off present satisfaction so we can save and invest resources in capital accumulation. As we obtain and use more capital goods, we will be more productive. We will enjoy higher real incomes at a higher standard of living. Likewise, with more capital investment comes better technology that will further increase productivity. As we replace old capital goods when they wear out, people have the incentive to obtain the best quality and highest quality capital goods they can afford. We see then that technological advance is a third contributor to economic progress and human flourishing. Technology is essentially the knowledge of how to do something. It is the knowledge of how to design goods and combine means in certain ways to achieve particular ends. A technical advance contributes to economic progress in three ways. In the first place, it allows for the development and use of more productive capital goods. Let us suppose you want to make a flourless chocolate cake, the greatest dessert in Western civilization, and therefore in human history. You need something to beat the eggs. Now, you can beat eggs with your hands. It is not pleasant, and it is not very efficient, but it can be done. You could also use a fork, a whisk, a hand mixer, or a stand mixer, and each of them is a different type of capital good embodying different technology. As you move from the technology of the fork to that to the whisk, to the hand mixer, to the stand mixer, you move, you're moving to a more and more advanced technology that contributes to more and more productivity. Additionally, people can develop more productive arrangements of the production process. An example of this is Walmart's warehouse design. One of the major achievements allowing Walmart to supply goods for lower prices is its warehouse arrangement. Traditionally, during the journey of a consumer good from the factory to the store, they are shipped from the factory to a warehouse where they're unloaded from the truck, and then they sit at the warehouse for some days or weeks until they are loaded on another truck to be shipped to several different retail stores. Walmart, however, developed a technique called cross-docking, whereby merchandise containers on trucks came into their distribution centers and are immediately unloaded and reloaded on trucks headed out to the retail stores. This greatly reduces the time goods need to sit on the warehouse shelves not generating any income. And that is a technological innovation that made them more efficient than they used to be and more efficient than their competitors. Finally, technical improvement has led to a larger variety of consumer goods that can, can serve more of our ends. On the one hand, my parents used to talk to one another when they were courting, as they used to say, on an old crank phone. When I was a child, my aunt and uncle had a rotary phone, and they just hoped that they didn't have to call someone with a lot of zeros in the number because it seemed to take forever for it to get uh, to dial the number. Now, the vast majority of people carry around with them mini computers that can allow them to make phone calls as well as send text me messages simply by giving a voice command. That is technological advance in consumer goods. The bottom line is that technological advance is another way we can enjoy economic progress. And if we use technology wisely, it will promote human flourishing. A fourth crucial source of economic prosperity that is often easily forgotten is the importance of entrepreneurship. All the production we've been talking about in the economic order, all the production that takes place in the, within the division of labor, all the capital accumulation, all the allocation of land, labor, and capital goods, all the technological development, all requires entrepreneurial judgment. The entrepreneur is a driving force of production, and the entrepreneur is the one who obtains and directs scarce factors of production. Now, entrepreneurship is important because economic progress is not guaranteed. Waste is possible because production decisions in the present are based on a forecast of uncertain future market conditions. And the entrepreneur is the one who bears the uncertainty by facing the risk of producing a good now that is only going to be sold at some point into the future. And therefore, the entrepreneur needs to make wise judgments.
And these judgments have many, many margins. What type of product should be made? What quality should the product be? Where should production facilities be located? How large should the scale of operation be? When do the goods need to be available? What is the anticipated price uh, buyers are willing to pay? The entrepreneur must make decisions also about the intensity, durability, specificity, and quantity of capital investment. He must decide the specific technological characteristics he wants his products to feature. The production technique he desires to use, the technology embodied in the capital goods he wants to use, and the level of research and development in which he wants to engage. All these questions must be answered before the products are produced and sold. And the answers are not baked in any economic functional cake. They are not answers that mathematicians can be derived. They are questions that must be answered through entrepreneurial judgment. If the producer forecasts incorrectly, he will use his capital making something people do not want enough to pay a price needed to cover his costs, and he will eat the loss. If the entrepreneur forecasts correctly, he will earn a profit for directing scarce factors towards the production of goods most valued by people in society. In other words, he receives a profit for doing precisely what people in society want him to do, provide the goods they want at the prices they're willing to pay. Entrepreneurs are not a leech on society. They are not parasites. They are not merely greedy capitalist pigs. They are the ones that produce for us all. That is why wise entrepreneurship is necessary for economic prosperity. Now, to fulfill their social function, entrepreneurs need to use economic calculation. They need a way to meaningfully compare the economic value of the product with the economic value of the factors they use to produce the product. Now, market prices are what allow entrepreneurs to make just such comparisons. And this is because money prices are all expressed in the same good, the monetary unit. And the beauty of free market prices is that these same objective monetary prices for both products and factors of production are determined by the subjective preferences of buyers and sellers. If the expected price of a product is greater than the sum of the price of the factors used to make the product, the entrepreneur will produce that good. And when entrepreneurs reap a profit, they do it precisely for providing goods that people value the most in the least costly way. If entrepreneurs squander scarce resources and squander scarce factors of production on unprofitable investments, they will bear the cost of their unwise action, and therefore they have every incentive to avoid such mistakes. Now, beyond this, it is important to note that we cannot neatly separate the sources of economic progress from one another and find a single key that explains it all. Some try to do this and say that the key to economic progress is capital. Others say, no, 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 it's technology. Still others say, no, it's institutions that explain it all, while some say, no, it's culture. In fact, the theory of economic prosperity is really one of synthesis. A highly developed division of labor would be impossible, for example, without the accumulation and use of capital goods. Likewise, a division of labor allows for people to specialize in the production of capital goods. Additionally, the entrepreneur must invest in, the, in capital in the production process. At the same time, capital per se never guarantees economic progress either because it must be wisely utilized for the entrepreneur to reap profits and contribute to human flourishing. Now, for technology to be productive, it must be bound up in actual capital goods and so requires investment. Economic progress, therefore, is the happy consequence of a highly developed division of labor taking advantage of an increasing capital stock embodying better technology wisely invested by entrepreneurs. The theory of economic progress has important implications for institutions that enable material prosperity for human flourishing. Now, there are two social institutions that foster the development of the division of labor, the accumulation of capital, technical improvement, and successful entrepreneurship. One is private property, and the other is sound money. We can only specialize in producing certain things if we can trade our excess to get other things that we want. We can only engage in trade if we own our goods. We must have private property, therefore, to have a thriving exchange society so that we can specialize in production according to efficiency. So we can only benefit from the division of labor if we have private property. People must also have the incentive to save and invest in capital and they, if we want capital accumulation, and they will only do so if 
They are, have the assurance that they can allocate their capital as they deem best and if they can keep the proceeds of their wise investments. Likewise, people have the incentive to research, develop, and utilize better technology if they are free to do so. Finally, market prices are meaningful manifestations of people's subjective preferences only if they are market prices determined by a process of voluntary exchange. Therefore, sound money is also important. Sound money is money free from state interference. If the government or its monetary authority manipulates the money supply, it will result in changes in the price structure that are not reflective of real economic factors. Wherever the state tries to fund investment with monetary inflation rather than voluntary savings, entrepreneurs are led astray and encouraged to invest in unprofitable endeavors. Economic calculation is falsified. Capital is consumed and productivity declines. Real incomes are lower and the standard of living falls. We see then that economic prosperity for human flourishing requires an extensive division of labor, capital accumulation, technical improvement, all coordinated by entrepreneurs. The institutional arrangements that enable these sources of prosperity to work together are private property and sound money. They are the institutions that undergird the free society and enable our responding to the creation mandate in a way that promotes human flourishing rather than descending into a barbaric struggle for survival.